Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. This government has no credibility. They claim they listened, but it is clear they did not. No senior in the province of Ontario asked for their drug benefit deductible not to be one. nearly doubled. No parent asked for their child activity tax credit to be cut. One. No one thought that a toonie would help seniors struggling to pay their $800 hydro bill. Mr. Speaker, why does the middle class have to pay for this government's smoke and mirrors budget? Thank you. Well, Speaker, uh, we're very proud of the budget that uh, the Minister of Finance uh, presented last week, and uh, clearly there are several uh, initiatives in that budget that help Ontarians, Speaker, not least of which is free tuition for uh, low-income families and more affordable tuition for middle-income families. That one initiative alone, Speaker, takes a tremendous burden off middle-income families. Uh, we're also creating 110,000 jobs through our uh, $160 billion infrastructure plan. 110,000 jobs a year, Speaker, are being created because of our investments. I think that helps the middle class, Speaker. We're increasing health care funding by $1 billion. $1 billion yes, in sir. one year. That's the increase. That's going to help every one of us who access, accesses our health care system. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. The government only tells part of the story. It's important to tell the whole story and actually read the fine print. In the next two years, this government will take a quarter of a billion dollars from Ontario families and taking away their tax credits. The healthy homes renovation tax credit, gone. That means Ontario seniors will now have to pay $19 million more to make their homes accessible. Yep. Families who have children in sports and arts programs will have to pay another $65 million. Wow. Going to university or college over the next two years, don't be fooled. No. Combined, those students will pay another $165 million because you're killing the education tax credit. Stop. Mr. Speaker, Stop. Robin Hood didn't steal from the hard-working middle class. Why is this government? Well, Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased that the Leader of the Opposition has raised this issue because uh, it's, we're acting on a recommendation from Don Drummond's uh, uh, Commission on uh, the Reform of the Public Sector. Speaker. One of the things that Don Drummond urged us to do was look at the tax credits that actually cost us a significant amount of money and ask ourselves, are we achieving the outcomes we had hoped would be achieved with that tax credit? So when it comes to the, uh, to the uh, home renovation tax credit, that actually turns out was uh, not too many people were taking advantage of it, and those who were were people with significant means. And there's a federal tax credit that does the same thing. So yes, we eliminated that tax credit because it wasn't having the outcome that it was intended to have. Answer. Similar with the children's activity tax credit. It wasn't having the uptake. It wasn't actually getting kids into sports. It wasn't getting Thank them into you. recreation. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Uh, before I move to final supplementary, two things. Um, the interjections are starting to rise. I'm going to bring them down. Uh, number two, I would caution the member on things you cannot say indirectly uh, that you can't say directly. So I just caution him on the last phrase that uh, he used. Uh, so avoid that, please. Uh, final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. I appreciate the government's spin, but beyond the smoke and mirrors, the reality is the middle class is paying more. For every bill and fee they're seeing with this government, it's all going up. That's the reality of this budget. There doesn't seem to be a fee that isn't increasing. Camping, fishing, hunting, court applications, liquor licenses, event permits, even for charity. It's all going up. He Deputy House Leader. And the cost of gas going up. Everything is going up with this budget. So, Mr. Speaker, when will this government realize that they are breaking the backs of Ontario's families? When will you stop this attack on Ontario's middle class? Thank you. 
seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, I guess, Speaker, the new PC party is against uh, helping those who are facing the greatest challenges. That's, I think, unfortunate. But let's talk about what we are doing to help the middle class. We're lowering hospital parking fees. 900,000 patients and visitors every year will benefit from lower hospital parking fees. The shingles vaccine, Speaker, people have been asking for us to fund the shingles vaccine, and we are moving forward with that in this budget. We're, uh, we're spending $100 million, Speaker, to help people lower their home energy uh, uh, consumption, Speaker, $100 million. I think that's helping the middle class. We're eliminating the $30 drive clean fee, Speaker. We're continuing to lower auto insurance. Uh, I'll start. A member from Renfrew, come to order. Uh, answer. Not to mention the 260,000 kids who are taking advantage of full-day kindergarten. Thank Ontario. you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, I'm going to ask for her sincere consideration. I've been clear that the PC caucus will support a good idea no matter where its origin is, no matter where and what side of the legislature it comes from. Today, the Liberals have a chance to do the same. We've been joined by patients and their families struggling with rare disorders. They have traveled here today to show their support for the member from Kitchener-Conestoga and his motion to create a select committee to examine the enormous challenges facing the rare disease community. Mr. Speaker, will the government put their partisanship aside, recognizing this will help their, these families, the, this will help these patients? Will the government support the member from Kitchener-Conestoga in this important motion? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to commend the member from Kitchener-Conestoga. He has been a tireless advocate on behalf of uh, individuals uh, in this province who do uh, have uh, rare diseases and their families and their communities, and he's done important work. And Mr. Speaker, I was proud earlier this week to uh, meet with many individuals from across the province that do have uh, rare disease or are advocates or family members of people uh, with rare diseases, and uh, it's clear that we need to continue to do more. I announced funding uh, at University Health Network for uh, a particular rare disease, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, yeah, uh, funding for a center of excellence at University Health Network, and quite frankly, a template that can be used because it was evolved through an expert panel that we created of clinical experts. Uh, patients were part of that as well, of that process, where we created a template I think that will be beneficial for other rare diseases as well. Yes, I'm happy to speak more in the supplementals. Thank you. Supplement, uh, supplemental, the member from Kitchener Council. Back to the minister. Minister, we've had people from across the province travel here today to mark their support for a united and transparent effort that will finally address rare disease suffering. Year after year, they've watched on as government has turned its back on their pleas for help. They have watched as government acknowledges their challenges with stopgap measures and one-off announcements that have only prolonged the suffering. Today, I'm proposing an all-party select committee process which every one of these people and the hundreds of thousands they represent are prepared to stand by. Fair to me. Minister, will you stand with them? Very good. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I, um, the, one of the other aspects of the announcement on uh, Monday, and I, I have to commend, uh, the, among others, the uh, Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders yeah. that convened the, uh, the day on Monday where many individuals, family members and advocates on behalf of individuals with rare disease came to Queen's Park. I met with them and uh, talked with them about another uh, important initiative that this government has taken, building on the work that we've done through the expert panel on uh, Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. We are creating a working group, Mr. Speaker, that will be focused focused solely on provincial efforts for rare diseases. It will be comprised of clinical experts, experts in the field. It will be comprised of patients and patient advocates as well, so that we can work on those fundamental issues of detection, prevention, detection, providing the appropriate supports, uh, access to Answer. drugs as well, all of the elements that are important uh, as a government that we should be providing for these individuals. And I'm happy to speak uh, more again, once again in the Thank supplemental you. that I know that is coming. Yeah. Final supplementary. Did you get an answer? <clears throat> I didn't hear an answer. Yet. Minister, your working group announcement earlier this week was an acknowledgement of the need 
for government response to the heart-wrenching struggles inaction has allowed to fester for too many years. Later today, you will have the opportunity to build on that acknowledgement by supporting the open all-party select committee process that has proven successful in leading to informed recommendations that demand government's response. Minister, don't turn your back on rare disease sufferers. Will you support my motion today, yes or no? Hear, hear. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think um, those that, uh, that have rare diseases and disorders uh, would agree that uh, it's important to have a working group to begin action now, Mr. Exactly. Speaker, to bring together clinical experts, to bring together patients and patient advocates, to begin to take concrete steps like we did earlier this week in announcing the Center of Excellence for a Rare Disease, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, quoting the Canadian... Merci. After the government's announcement, the CORE, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, said today on International Rare Disease Day, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders welcomes the announcement made by Ontario Rainbow. Health Minister Eric Hoskins to open a new clinic, uh, which could be expanded to other rare yes, disorders, sir. as well as his commitment to strike a working group to develop an Ontario approach to a coordinated provincial health care system for patients Thank you. with rare disorders. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, I was in London talking to nurses about health care. Nurse Rebecca Smith told me that her shift at London Health Sciences on Tuesday night was the worst shift she has ever worked in 16 years. Speaker. There were 21 patients with psychiatric emergencies, but because of Liberal cuts, a hospital boardroom was turned into an overflow room. A hospital boardroom became a room for patients. Other patients were waiting over eight hours to be seen in emergency. When someone is facing a psychiatric crisis, Speaker, they deserve care, not an eight-hour wait in a makeshift converted boardroom, followed by seven days stuck in the ER because there aren't any beds. When Rebecca left her shift the next morning, Question. there were still 100 people waiting in the ER. Will this acting premier acknowledge that liberal health care cuts are hurting Ontario's Thank you. patients? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, I think a couple of months ago, that I had the privilege and the honour uh, with the uh, President of the Treasury Board, the MPP for London North Centre, to uh, be in London to announce uh, the opening, the commitment by the government of $1.2 million uh, towards uh, the opening of a new mental health and addictions crisis centre in London. That is precisely going to do the important work that the member of the leader of the third party is referring to, providing crisis intervention for adults uh, age 16 and up uh, living in London and Middlesex County, individuals who are experiencing a mental health uh, or addiction crisis that require that immediate response yes, uh, or support. They can provide that in the community. It will be run by the Canadian Mental Health Association. It was a great announcement Thank and you. an important investment, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, regardless of how privileged this health minister is, the psychiatric patients in London are still falling through the cracks, Speaker. And those are not the only health cuts that are hurting patients and hurting Ontarians. Last week, without any warning or consultation, struggling seniors across Ontario learned that the Liberals would be nearly doubling their drug costs. Earlier this week, the Premier of this province had a eureka moment, Speaker, and she decided that she would suddenly decide to hold consultations and actually talk to people about her plan to make seniors pay more for prescription drugs. But so far, this Premier and this Liberal government has not promised the seniors of Ontario that anything will actually change. Will this Liberal government make a clear commitment to seniors that they won't be paying more for their prescription drugs? 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'm still, like, as the, with, per the question yesterday, I'm still confused as to whether the leader of the third party is asking for more consultation or less consultation. I would hope that she would agree. Now that we've now that we've actually posted the regulation, it would be the appropriate Remember thing from for us to have the opportunity to, to have discussions uh, with seniors and seniors groups, their advocates, and others across the healthcare spectrum to look at ways that we can make sure we get this right for all seniors. Of course, our focus in the budget, as the premier has said, is to bring 170,000 more low-income, the lowest-income seniors into a bracket where they pay no annual deductible. And I, I ask, I plead to the member, to the leader of the third party, that she just simply reference that 170,000 more seniors who will benefit once. Answer. It's an important acknowledgement that they actually care just that we're once. we're helping those who are most vulnerable to, to go into that that bracket, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Final supplementary. Sure. We know how confused this minister is, and it's just too bad that it's the patients of Ontario that are paying the price for his confusion, Speaker. Liberal health cuts are not just affecting prescription drug costs for seniors and care for psychiatric emergency patients. On Tuesday, I was at a rally with hundreds of Hamilton nurses sending the alarm bells or sounding the alarm bells about further positions being cut at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. The meager funding gestures in the budget were little more than token speaker. Will this government admit to Ontarians that they will continue? They will continue to see a an erosion of their health care system, including more firing of nurses and longer wait times for patients. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are investing one billion new dollars into the health care system this year, and 345 million, which represents an over 2% increase to the hospital line in the budget. Mr. Speaker, we're increasing our hospital funding by more than 345 million. Yeah. We're adding new dollars into home and community care, 250 million dollars. We're adding 75 million more dollars into uh, hospice and end of life and palliative care, Mr. Speaker. We're adding money into mental health supports across this province. We're adding money into a new shingles vaccine that will make available free of charge to seniors between the ages of 65 and 70. There are many, many new investments that add up to $1 billion more, nearly $52 billion this year spent on health care. I'm proud of the investments that we're making. They're making Answer. a real difference. Yep. Okay. No question, the leader is her party. Speaker, my next question is also for the acting premier. It has taken less than a week for the premier of this province to acknowledge and admit that her budget has serious flaws. Speaker, hospital funding is not keeping up with inflation. It is not keeping up with population growth. It is not keeping up with the pressures and demands of an aging population. Speaker, this is another serious flaw in our budget or in their budget that they introduced last week. Will this acting premier admit that what this means to Ontarians is even less health care for them when they need it? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, her numbers just don't add up, Mr. Speaker. $345 million in new funding to our hospitals is a more than 2 percent increase in the funding that goes to the hospitals, Mr. Speaker. It's more than the rate of inflation. It's more than the consumer price index. It's an important investment, and that's quite separate, Mr. Speaker, from the $12 billion over the next decade that we're investing in new hospitals and new and improved hospitals. Hospitals like the, which doesn't even include built, recently built and announced open hospitals like the Humber River Hospital or the new Oakville Hospital, the funding that we're providing to hospitals all over the province, Providence Care in Kingston, yep. Mackenzie Vaughan Hospital for York Region, renovations to acute and long-term care beds at Atacokan General Hospital. And we're also adding to the funding that we have for maintenance and renovations. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, second time. In that funding for renovations and maintenance in hospitals. So our hospitals are growing, Mr. Speaker. Yes, the operating budgets are increasing. We're in, adding to the capital investments that we're making in our hospitals. Thank you. And we're seeing the improvements in outcomes. Supplementary. The Minister of Health should darn well know what the inflationary pressures are on a hospital, including population growth, including an aging demographic. He's not telling the whole facts around 
what's happening to the pressure in hospitals. And whether it's 1 percent or 2 percent, he's splitting hairs on the fact that hospitals are feeling the crunch and they are closing beds, Speaker. They are firing nurses. They are postponing and cancelling uh, operations, procedures. Speaker, health care is supposed to be about people. That's what health care is supposed to be about. Struggling seniors are being told that they're going to see their medication costs nearly double, Speaker. Why is this government attempting to balance the budget on the backs of seniors and patients in Ontario? Thank you. Well, you know, it, a $1 billion new investment in health care, yes, Mr. Speaker. And I know the leader of the third party might believe that our hospitals are the centre of the health care universe. They're an important foundation of our health care system. Perhaps she doesn't want to reform and transform her health care system so it truly is patient-centered, that it truly does focus on outcomes, Mr. Speaker. The investments and the transformations that we're making, they involve our hospitals, and we've reflected that in an additional $345 million. But we're also moving patients and procedures and opportunities and care and support outside of our hospital environment to home and community care, an additional $250 million in the coming year, which was the investment, the new investment we made this year as well in home and community care as we continue to take advantage of the reality that we can provide support and services. We're making, and we announced in this year's budget as well, further investments in long-term care. We're making investments in mental health services where the evidence shows and the outcomes are better when we actually care for those individuals outside of the hospital environment when we can, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I would hope that the member of the third, the leader of the third party. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, yesterday I heard stories of community care nurses who were finding <laughs> IV needles still in the arms of patients who were discharged with those needles in their arms. That's what kind of community care is being provided because the hospitals are overloaded and can't do the kind of job that they want to do, Speaker. People expect their health care system. Clark. Stop, Clark. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will uh, come to order. They also told me of patients who are revolving back into emergency because they're leaving hospitals too sick and they are not getting the kind of community care that they need and they deserve. That is not the kind of transformation that takes care of patients the way that they should be taken care of. Speaker. People expect the health care system to be there for them where they need it and when they need it. It is one of the basics that people expect their government to get right. But instead of getting it right, people see fewer nurses, closed hospital Question. beds, cancelled surgeries, overflowing ERs, more expensive medications for seniors. How has this government lost sight of the fact that health care is supposed to be about people? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from uh, Newmarket, Aurora, will come to order. Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, just because she says it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, Mr. Speaker, I think, I think it's important that we look at the facts. I think we look at the facts. We look at the fact that we have some of the best. Order. Order. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the facts include we have the shortest wait times in all of Canada, Mr. Speaker. We have among the best cancer care in the entire world, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We have the best outcomes and outcomes that are improving. An independent study Answer. by the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Stu Studies has shown we are getting, as a result of our changes, shorter wait times in hospitals. I'm not going to accept that. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. You have 10 seconds. With our changes to health care, our funding reform, increased number of patients being treated, minimal impact on readmission rates. Thank and it's you. Just, that's 10 seconds. No question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, good morning. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Today, the uh, Financial Accountability Officer 
referred to the budget as, quote, vague and uncertain. That's because last week's budget confirmed the government is using one-time revenues and contingency funds to make the deficit appear smaller. One example is using one-time money from the brisk housing market, $500 million in extra sales tax revenue and $300 million more in land transfer taxes were booked as operating revenue. And BMO Capital Markets wrote, quote, asset sales of $5.7 billion are, quote, a one-time in nature and don't address any underlying structural deficit. Speaker, I ask the minister, why do you continue to use one-time money to artificially uh, lower your deficit. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by thanking the Financial Accountability Officer for his report. Mr. Speaker, the FAO has an important mandate to provide forward-looking commentary. And on page one of his report, the FAO confirms that we are on target and on schedule to balance the budget by 2017-18, Mr. Speaker. It quotes, Ontario 2016 budget reaffirmed the government's commitment to eliminate the budget deficit by 2017-18 and to maintain a balanced budget going forward. It's also important to note that the FAO affirms key aspects of our plan. He specifically highlights that the, the, the fact that our assumptions for new federal funding are prudent, Mr. Speaker. And in our budget preparation process each year, we ask private sector economists to review our assumptions in order to ensure that they're valid. And in 2016, it was no different. Three economic experts reviewed our economic forecast and affirmed that they are reasonable, and that's on page 245 of the budget, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, what we didn't hear was, back to the minister, was that the because of using one-time funding, the financial accountability officer also said, quote, maintaining balanced budgets beyond 2017 will likely prove challenging, Speaker. This government is so desperate for cash, they're threatening to go back as far as 1989 to target commercial entities for land transfer taxes. This is frightening the markets. They see through the, the desperation and making Ontario less desirable Member for Magnuson Lawrence. Speaker Bryn Purchase, Ontario's former chief economist and deputy to many ministries, stated, quote, the added revenue from cap and trade and the Hydro One sale helped to make the provincial numbers look better. Every expert sees through Member for what this the Lord, government time. is doing, Speaker. Question. I ask the minister, just who do you think you're fooling with this pre-election number fudging? Mr. Speaker, the budget and the. No. Uh, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. Guard your language in terms of what you're supposed to say in here, please. Good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In preparation of the document and in preparation of the budget, you take forecasts. We have leading economic forecasters from across the country. Over 15 of them provide their, uh, their projections. We then take them, average them, and taper them down. Furthermore, we look at experts and they review them. And here is this. And listen, Mr. Speaker, I apologize. Looking at the full outlook period for the 2016 budget, which covers 16 to 19, our government's average nominal GDP growth forecast is in line with those private sector forecasts. New economic data since the release of our budget confirms the economy is on track and advancing in a relatively robust pace. And independent advice is important to the government, and that is why we indeed value the Financial That's Accountability right. Office input. So it's important to note the budget assessments by two trading agencies, credit rating agencies, which the member opposite often refers to, Thank and you. here's what they say. We're not going to hear that. New question. The member from London, the member from London Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister for Seniors Affairs. All of us in this House have a duty to stand up for seniors in our ridings, but it's the Minister's job to speak up at the Cabinet table and ensure all seniors are protected. Yes. Speaker, this budget shows the Minister didn't do his job and the Premier didn't listen to the people of Ontario. Instead of helping people, the Liberals have chosen to force most seniors to pay 70 per cent more on their prescription drugs starting as early this summer. Every member in this House should know that's wrong, and this minister should know better than anyone. People deserve to know. Will the Minister for Seniors 
toe the Liberal line, or will he do his job and stand up for seniors by telling this Premier she's out of touch with the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question, and let me say, uh, deviate for a second before I answer the question, Speaker, that uh, tomorrow it's the deadline for all the uh, seniors community uh, groups for uh, submitting the seniors community application grant. Oh. I would <laughs> Speaker, I will take the opportunity to I advise every member of the House, since we only have another day, to get on with their community seniors groups because this particular program is huge and 104 ridings out of 107 ridings, they are benefiting from this program. So I would hope that the member gets busy, conduct the seniors which we are helping, and I hope that they put in some applications for the benefits of our seniors in every riding of this province, people. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'm busy, again to the minister, I'm busy worrying about what's, what this Liberal government's doing to seniors' health care. Here's what the Liberal plan hikes, hikes drug costs really mean to seniors. It means more worry for seniors on fixed incomes. It means tighter household budgets and less retirement security. It undermines the principle of universal access to health care, which should include prescription drugs. Deputy House Leader, and second first time. of all, it means seniors can't trust the Premier to listen and put their priorities first. Seniors deserve a minister that will speak up for them and say no to the Premier's plan to hike the price on drugs for seniors. Will the minister commit to, to seniors by voting against the Liberal budget today that increases costs for Ontario seniors? Do the right thing. Stop the Thank you. Minister? Seniors, uh, Speaker, as I travel throughout Ontario, seniors groups are very delighted with what we are giving them to support them, to keep them active and engaged. And the budget, Speaker, reflects and builds on what we have been providing for our seniors. $250 million, Speaker, as the Minister of Health has been mentioned, for home care and community care. $170 million, Speaker, for the seniors between 65 and, and 70, for the single, single vaccine, Speaker. $75 million additional for three years for community-based residential hospice and palliative. Speaker, the people in palliative and uh, hospice, they are seniors as well, Speaker, and we are looking at those people there. Speaker, 50% reduction of hospital parking spaces. 130,000 seniors are yes, benefiting from that, Speaker. And, Speaker, what do I have to say? 173,000 seniors saving $100 on their prescription. Wow. Thank you. New question, the member from uh, Quinty West, uh, West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question today is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, we know that investment in infrastructure across our province is key to economic growth. Besides playing a big part in our quality of life, investing in infrastructure is one of the most important things we can do to stimulate the economy in the short term and improve our pro productivity and competitiveness in the long term. Whether it's the expansion of a regional road or a wastewater system running under our streets, we all depend on high quality infrastructure to keep our communities functioning. Despite their smaller population, rural municipalities continue to have a big infrastructure demand. People need their roads widened and their bridges secured. Rural and small town Ontario cannot be left behind by investing on our, in our big cities. Minister, could you please inform the House on what this government is doing to improve rural infrastructure? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Northumberland, Quitty West, uh, for his question this morning. As many of this House would know, uh, prior to coming here in 2003, the member for Northumberland, Quitty West, was probably one of the most popular mayors ever in the history of Brighton, Ontario. But he knows full well. That's why part of our largest investment in infrastructure in Ontario's history Rural municipalities continue to access funding under the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, 
OCIF helps small, rural, and northern communities build and repair roads, bridges, water, wastewater treatment systems, uh, projects that deliver our local community needs across the province. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind everybody in this House, in the late 1990s, we had the who does what committee. It was the who got done in committee. Right. That was municipalities in eastern Ontario, where 43 percent of all the roads and bridges were downloaded, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I'm glad to hear, and I know my constituents in the right of Northumbria Community West, along with uh, Coburg Mayor Brock Neer, uh, Mayor Wallace from Brighton and Mayor Harrison from uh, Quinty West that spoke very highly about this infrastructure funding, Speaker, uh, uh, Minister. You, you have made it clear our government believes in working collaboratively with all levels of government to ensure we do what's best for the province and its people. Rural communities have, have competing interests when it comes to deciding what local infrastructure projects to fund. They have a diverse range of needs, including roads, bridges, water, supply networks. This funding will deliver on some long-standing municipal needs. But, Mr. Speaker, municipalities need permanent predictable Question. formula up allocation to help local government plan accordingly. Mr. Speaker, in, in order to protect their quality of life and foster new economic development, Thank you. could the minister inform? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Northumberland Quinty West uh, for his uh, supplementary. On uh, Monday of the uh, Robo-OGA conference, uh, Premier Wind uh, delivered exceptional good news to rural municipalities. We announced that OCIF will triple from $100 million to $300 million per year for 2018-19. With $200 million, we'll be in predictable, formula-based funding to meet asset management plans for those municipalities. A hundred million will be available in application-based funding, allowing smaller municipalities to apply to invest in critical infrastructure needs. Mr. Speaker, don't take my word on how good this program is. I want to, I want to quote the mayor from Smith Falls, Ontario, wow. Sean Pankow, who claimed for the first time I've seen at, at Robo OGA, it's encouraging to come back with some positive news. All right. Your question, the member from Bruce Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. In June 2015, you cut $20 million from the Assistive Devices Program. We warned you then that this cut would result in long waits for service and damaging results in more than 300,000 Ontarians who depend on it. But, Minister, you disagreed and dismissed our concern over the cuts as, per, and I quote, providing it in a more efficient way. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, I want to know what are the wait times for assistive devices after the government imposed cuts from 10 months ago? Good question. Thank you. Minister Self Walter and Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of uh, our ADP, our assistive devices program. It yep. assists uh, many, many Ontarians. In fact, it provides, uh, there are 8,000 different supports and devices that are things. included in our ADP program. And, and uh, last year, uh, we actually uh, helped 350,000 Ontarians wow. with support uh, to obtain those devices and, and often to maintain them as well. And, and in fact, that's increased dramatically. It's pretty well doubled since we came into office well, Jeff, in you know 2003. In fact, we've you know doubled, more than doubled our funding since we came into office and formed government in 2003. And it includes a, an, a whole variety of items from home oxygen to insulin pumps and ostomy supplies. Uh, it is a program which is challenging because the need is great, Mr. Speaker, and we try yes, to sir. make sure that we provide the level of support that it, each, each individual requires. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Jeff Preston suffers from muscular dystrophy and has spent his whole life in a wheelchair. Jeff is one of those 300,000 Ontarians whose life depends on timely access to adaptive equipment through assistive devices. He has been waiting to be assessed for a suitable wheelchair for almost a year, wondering each day, and these are his words, Shame. Minister, if this will be the day of his worst nightmare where he is made a prisoner in his own home. There are too many vulnerable Ontarians like Jeff Preston facing the intolerably long wait and are left suffering. Mr. Speaker, my question is, what action is the minister going to take today to remedy this inexcusable backlog so that Jeff and all other interns needing repairs for their assistive devices, wheelchairs and prosthetics can live with dignity and independence? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, 
you know, I want to commend Dr. Preston as well, Mr. and I was just uh, sorry, Mr. Preston, that uh, my colleagues have just uh, re-emphasized that he's a tremendous advocate for uh, individuals that do require. And in fact, my ministry has reached out uh, to uh, to Mr. to, to Dr. <laughs> Preston. To, we have reached out to him, and uh, we are uh, listening to his advice, and he's providing a lot of very good advice. Advice. So I'm not sure what more Order, the member please. opposite would like me to do. We are working with him. He is providing good advice. He is a great advocate for this, and it, and it works within the context of a program that is providing more than 8,000 devices and supports to Ontarians, to more than 350,000 Ontarians. It's an important program. We're yes, proud sir? of the fact that we have doubled the number of people that benefit, and we've more than doubled the funding for the program. Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor West. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. The minister claims that the potential closure of schools offering specialized supports has nothing to do with money. She even went so far as to say that it's for the sake of the children. Speaker, why don't we let the children have a say in what's best for them? A student at Trillium School said, please don't let the Liberals close my school. The school gives people like myself hope. Hope that we can get a job, hope that we can get an education so we can live a happy life. The closure of Robarts School for the Deaf or Amethyst School, both in London, would leave students in southwestern Ontario with nowhere else to turn. Will the Minister of Education listen to parents, education workers, and most of all, students, and commit to keeping all specialized provincial and demonstration schools open? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And I do want to reinforce that we are, in fact, committed to the success of all our students. That includes those who are deaf and hard of hearing and those who have severe learning disabilities. And we are reviewing the programs for those students. And part of that is we are going around and we actually are speaking with parents and students because we do want their input. But it's also true, Speaker, that uh, we updated the deaf definition of learning disabilities a few uh, years ago. We've updated the Provincial Policy Program Memorandum on Learning Disabilities, but we never actually reviewed how we, uh, how we would deliver the programs in our own provincial schools for children with severe learning disabilities. So, of course, we're having a look Answer. at the programs to make sure that we are providing the best service possible for all students with severe learning disabilities. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's unfortunate that the Deputy Premier was laughing through my question, considering both schools named are in her city. Ontarians are tired of hearing this government find any excuse to force schools to close. Now they're even suspending enrollment at specialized schools to build their case. Wow. My office has been inundated with emails from parents wondering why specialized demonstration schools are being told not to let any more children in if the government is only consulting. Yep. Usually you consult first before you make decisions that impact some of our most vulnerable kids. Students are emailing me devastated that schools designed to help them succeed could be shut down. Brutal. Families deserve more access to quality education, not less. So I ask again, will the Minister of Education ensure that no provincial or demonstration schools will be closed as a result of the consultations? Well, and of course, the process that we are going through right now is a consultation. We are talking to parents and students, and no decisions have been made at this point. But what I can certainly say is that I agree with one thing that you said, which is we need to ensure the best special education services for all students. And that's exactly what we're looking at, is how do we provide the best special education services for all children. That is my commitment. Thank you. Your question, the member from uh, Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, last year, our government announced major investments in transit as part of Budget 2015. By moving forward with our plan to unlock the value of certain public assets, we've been able to support those investments in transit infrastructure projects through our Moving Ontario Forward plan. The residents of my community of Etobicoke Lakeshore were extremely pleased to see our government announce a $13.5 billion 
is a billion dollar investment in improvements across the GO Transit network last year as part of this plan. And Mr. Speaker, this year's budget continues to build on these crucial investments. Can the minister please tell the members of this House more about how Budget 2016 will continue to build Ontario up? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for that fantastic question and for the wonderful job that he does, not just representing his community, but as parliamentary assistant involved in economic development, employment, and infrastructure. Speaker, as that member mentioned, last year our government announced unprecedented investments as part of Budget 2015. And, Speaker, this year our budget builds on this important plan. As a first step to achieving regional express rail, we are already working to deliver a series of network-wide GO Rail service improvements, including six new trips during the AM and PM for commutes on the Milton, Richmond Hill, and Stouffville corridor, Speaker, 10 new trips during off-peak hours on the Kitchener corridor to and from Brampton, and 52 new trips on each weekend day on the Kitchener corridor to and from Brampton and the Barrie corridor to and from Aurora, Speaker. Lord. Speaker, this year we are also announcing new and improved GO bus connections. Yes, to the GoRail network for important communities like Cambridge and Brantford, along with a lot more. Speaker, look forward to the supplementary answer as well. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his response. It's clear that our government continues to put a great uh, onus on investment in transit across the province. But transit isn't the only type of infrastructure that is important in creating a connected transportation network in Ontario. Uh, residents of Etobicoke Lakeshore work and travel throughout the province, and they want to know what our government is committed to investing in our roads and bridges and highways throughout Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell members of this House how this year's budget will help us build and maintain critical transportation infrastructure across the province? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thanks very much. A very important second part to the story of, of a Budget 2016 as it relates to highways, roads and bridges. Speaker, For example, the improvement of the Highway 417, Ottawa-Queensway corridor, the widening of nine kilometres of County Road 17 in the United Counties of Prescott and Russell, funding support for an additional ferry uh, in the Kingston area. Speaker, Speaker, this morning I spent some time with the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure, where we announced the expansion and the extension of Highway 427. Here, here. Speaker, this morning that important project saw us standing in front of literally hundreds of skilled tradespeople whose jobs and livelihoods will depend on this kind of investment from this government. And the one question those skilled tradespeople ask that minister and myself is, will Patrick Brown and Andrea Horvath stand up and support them and help us build Ontario up? There's a reason I'm standing. The minister does know better. I want people to address people in this house with their titles or their writings. It stays that way. I cannot let it slip. Uh, new question, the member from Thornhill. Here, here. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. The Toronto Police Service Abuse It and Lose It campaign has come to an end with shocking results. They inspected over 1,500 accessible permits to make sure they were being used properly. They issued 862 parking tickets and confiscated the permits of 293 individuals who were then charged. That was all in just two weeks. The Liberals have said that they were taking steps to combat this problem, yet the steps seem too slow. Mr. Speaker, will the minister work with the Minister of Community Safety to organize another blitz, perhaps this time outside of Toronto? Thank you, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you uh, very much, and appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. And uh, as you know, my uh, staff is working with her and her office to uh, speak about what she may be bringing forward in the legislature uh, in the form of a private member's bill with regard to a committee. As I said earlier on this question, uh, Speaker, it is despicable that anyone in Ontario would use a permit that is not for them uh, in the presence of an individual who has a disability, whether that is uh, a visible disability or not. One of the things I think that uh, we are finding, as the member uh, knows full well, is that municipalities have de uh, decided that they would allow different 
uh, areas where individuals can use these permits, and they're not consistent across the province, and that's a municipal decision. But what we are also finding as well is that the enforcement is working, and that those parking permits that we are now Answer. putting forward that are new and have greater security will help us reduce the fraud in the system. I have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. The Abuse It and Lose It campaign indicated a great need for enforcement and even more attention to accessible parking permit abuse. One in five permits inspected was being abused. The Toronto Police did an amazing job here in Toronto. Mr. Speaker, what is the minister planning to do in order to crack down on accessible parking permit abuse across the province? Thank you. No minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And just to uh, add further to uh, what I was saying a moment ago, with respect to the new permits, uh, the standards have been increased, barcodes are being added, uh, identification, specific identification now being required to be provided uh, to have those permits uh, released. I'm happy to review how individuals uh, receive those permits. There are a variety of of uh, healthcare professionals in Ontario that have the authority to issue those. those are, that's not a determination of uh, our ministry. Uh, if it's believed that an individual needs those uh, permits, there are health professionals that make that decision. We want to make sure, though, that what is being granted, uh, as the member opposite is highlighting, is a secure permit. And we also have to be mindful that there is an enforcement uh, element to this, that we need to ensure that individuals uh, are not using these Answer. permits who should not be using the permits. And I'm uh, committed to working with the member opposite to improve this system for all Ontarians. Thank, Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Once again, there are Francophones here from everywhere in Ontario. Welcome. They are here because they had access to education in French language in schools that were for and by them. Since last month, the minister has on his desk the report of the committee that should evaluate the capacity of those post-secondary institutions. And he also has with him another document on this topic. And those two reports recommend to have a University of Francophone Ontario. When will the minister put in place a transitional committee for this University of Francophone Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for that uh, question. Mr. Speaker, access to f French language post-secondary education is of prime importance of our, our government. And currently, we have two universities in the province of Ontario. They're bilingual. They're offering courses in two languages, English and French, Laurentian University and University of Ottawa. We have Glendon College at York University. We have two colleges, fully fr Francophone colleges, College Boreal, uh, as well as uh, La Cité in, 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 in Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, we are not going to take a lesson from the NDP when they created Great Lakes College and then they, they shut it down. We are doing this very carefully. Currently, we have 22,000 students, Mr. Speaker. They are studying in French language in our universities and the colleges, and we are so proud of the good work that our colleges and universities are doing in terms of provision of post-secondary education in French language. And we will continue our conversation Answer. with the stakeholders to make sure that French language post-secondary education is available for our population Merci. and young Thank you. people. Thank you. Mr. Minister, many young people here today with us in Queen's Park want to attend university. Many of them are part of the 2,000 sub, uh, registrations that we've had for the French University in Ontario. The minister says very, knows very well that these young people have a lack of access to francophone post-secondary education in Ontario. Can you tell these young people here today with us, when will you take the first step toward a francophone university in Ontario, and will this first step be done on time so that they can attend that university. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy to welcome our students here today. Mr. Speaker, you cannot find a go another government who's supported Francophonie so much in Ontario. 
the first step for, towards a Francophone university has been done a long time ago. We will not wait for their empty bills. We have a minister for uh, training colleges and university that set the process in pace already and people who are in 12th or 11th year will go to the francophone university i do not think so because we will not build that university tomorrow we will have to establish that university on very solid foundations to make sure it lasts we will not do like the college de grand lac that was set up set up on the back of a napkin and that was uh, set up by the New Democrats and closed by the Conservatives. Thank you. No question. The member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. I'm very proud to be part of the government that understands the importance of the North and the importance of mining sectors for our province. I know Ontario is the top district jurisdiction in Canada for mineral exploration. As one of us, uh, as many of us know, that the Prospectors and Developer Association of Canada will be holding its highly anticipated 2016 annual convention here in my riding of Trinity Spadina this week. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Northern Development and Mines please update the House? with respect to this annual convention and explain how it is showcasing Ontario's mining sector. Thank you, Minister of Northern Development. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for Trinity Spadina for giving me an opportunity to tell the members of the legislature about the Prospector, uh, Prospectors and Developers Association, better known as PDAC Conference, uh, starting this coming Sunday. Uh, Speaker, it's a remarkable gathering with over 20,000 attendees from over 100 countries and an opportunity for us, Speaker, to uh, showcase the many successes of the province's mining sector. We will be kicking off PDAC with uh, the annual Ontario reception this uh, Sunday evening. We want to welcome every member of the legislature to be there. We'll soon be welcoming delegates, including municipal, industry leaders, First Nation, Métis, and a whole bunch of others uh, to a great event, and we encourage everyone to attend. The one thing we really want to uh, make clear is the, that the province remains very much one of the most attractive destinations yes, for mineral exploration investment in, in North America. 2003 explorations were 193 million. This next last year's Mr. You. Speaker, 390 million. All good news. Great work. Supplementary. The minister for his answer uh, and the update, and thank you very much for the invitation for this weekend's uh, reception. Mr. Speaker, our province mining sector is impressive. I'm certainly pleased that Ontario is hosting its important international conference. I know that the international delegates who are here will enjoy all that the city of Toronto has to offer. As we all know, the mining industry is very important, not only for the northern Ontario, but for the entire province. Here, here. I know our province and our government continues to engage both corporate and First Nation partners to make sure we're creating a dynamic and innovative business climate that we need for this sector. Speaker, through you to the minister. How is our government showcasing our support for such important industry? Here, here. Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much again to the member for Trinity Spadana, and you said it so well. Uh, our, our government is absolutely dedicated to, to maintaining, if not growing and improving, a business climate uh, that attracts uh, investment into our province. There are some great opportunities. I do think it's important, Mr. Speaker, to say that in our budget last week, our government confirmed, reconfirmed our commitment to the, the mining sector with the $1 billion for infrastructure development in the Ring of Fire, which was huge, and I was most grateful to see that. We also made a strong commitment to the uh, uh, Northern Industrial electricity rate program, a program we made permanent last year, Mr. Speaker, $120 million investment every year, which is reducing energy costs for our major resource-based industries uh, all across the north. The fact is that Canada remains uh, the Canadian leader and one of the top jurisdictions in the world in exploration yes, expenditures in the world. We are going to keep doing the best job we can do to promote the mining sector, to build it up, create jobs, and build our economy up. Thank you. Thank you. Question, member from Conservative Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Acting Premier. Since 1870, a provincial school for deaf and hearing impaired students has had a home in the city of Belleville. On Tuesday, the Minister of Education said that enrollment at the school was healthy and that the ministry was looking at other schools to close. Yesterday, she told my local media 
that no decisions have been made on the future of these provincial and demonstration schools. Speaker, why is the Minister of Mixed Messages playing games with the education? But, uh, first of all, the member knows that it's not acceptable. He will correct himself and withdraw. I'll ask his question. Uh, speaker, why is the minister playing games with the education of deaf and hearing impaired students, and will the government commit today to keeping Sir James Whitney School open? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Education. Yes, I am committed to keeping Sir James Whitney School for the deaf open. It has never been on the consultation list. The same is true for E.C. Drury School for the Deaf and uh, W. Ross McDonald School for the Blind. We have said from the very beginning that we are not consulting on those schools. What we have said is that we were looking at CJL, and in fact, the French Language Commissioner uh, wrote a report on CJL a few years ago and asked us to review the whole governance issue at CJL, which is part of what we're looking at at CJL. And as I explained earlier in question period, we are also looking at the whole issue of how we deliver Answer. services for the severe learning disabled. Thank you. Supplementary. And I, I thank the minister for confirming that same, Sir James Whitney School will remain open, but the government knows that Saganaska uh, Sagan uh, Demonstration School, which operates on the same campus and same site, is in, is in question. Its future is in question. That school provides education for children with special needs that require more attention than other schools or other boards can provide. Parents of children with special needs, like phonological dyslexia, are being told that registration for their children is frozen for next year. They're worried that you're going to force their kids into programs and schools that aren't equipped to serve their special needs. So, Speaker, my question for the minister is a simple one. Is she prepared to guarantee that Saganaska School will not close and that our most vulnerable and deaf and hearing impaired children will be able to get an education from one of these few schools in Ontario that actually is capable of meeting their special needs? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Minister. Yes, and, and uh, I want to confirm what the member said about the programs that are offered at the uh, demonstration schools. I haven't had an opportunity to visit Saganasco yet, uh, but I, that way is on my to-do list is to get there. But certainly in the uh, demonstration schools, uh, it is very clear that they, they provide an excellent program. That's actually not the question. The question is, how do we meet the best needs of all children who have severe learning disabilities? And part of what I hear from parents is that they have not necessarily be well, been well served previously. And that's exactly why we need to do a consultation on the programming to make sure that we are serving the needs of all Answer. children who have severe learning disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. The member from London Fanshawe on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I would like to introduce um, dietitians from my riding, London, or my city of London, uh, Carol Morgan and Kim Sandyfield. Uh, welcome to the legislature. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 163, an act to amend the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act 1997 and the Ministry of Labour Act with respect to post-traumatic stress disorder. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 163, an act to amend the Workplace Safety Insurance Act 1997 and the Ministry of Labour Act with respect to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, on February the 22nd, 2016, Mr. Flynn moved second reading of Bill 163. All those in favour of the bill, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mrs. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bernardinetti. Mr. Bernardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madam Lalonde. Madam Lalonde. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Balkis. Mr. Balkis. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jassic. Mrs. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Domerla. Mr. Domerla. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Shubisan. Mr. Shubisan. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Shumanta. Ms. Shumanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 91, the nays are 0. The ayes being 91 and the nays being 0, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill. Do you have a motion to the bill? Pursuant to the order of the House dated March 2, 2016, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. There are no further uh, deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.